Um, now I'm very pleased to uh, present our next speaker, who is um, uh, Dr. Uh, Sari Siegel. Let me tell you a little bit uh, about Dr. Siegel. Uh, she's a historian who works at the intersection of Holocaust history and the history of medicine. Uh, she completed her doctoral st st studies at uh, USC, the University of Southern California, and was a uh, Jeffrey Hartman postdoc at Yale, at Yale University's Fortunoff Video Archives, um, which also works with us here at the museum. Uh, she is a visiting assistant professor at UCLA and acting assistant professor in the program of history of medicine at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. She's also the founding director of the Center for Medicine, Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Cedar sinai uh, She, uh, her, her research has been supported by number, numerous institutions uh, and her dissertation was Between Coercion and Resistance, Jewish Prisoner Physicians in Nazi Camps, 1940 to 1945. And she's adapting that dissertation uh, to become a book. Um, she's had fellowships in a number of places, including um, uh, the USHMM, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and others, and uh, has published articles in uh, uh, Holocaust and Genocide Studies and the Journal of Genocide Research. Um, and there's a lot more to say, but uh, I'm delighted, uh, Dr. Siegel, that you're here. And without further ado, I would like to hand the floor over to you. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, and I would like to thank you for including me in this important program. And it is really a privilege to share my research with this audience and to be in such an impressive lineup of contributing scholars. Well, so to just lay things out, I just wanna show that I have a few main goals that I would like to accomplish in the time I have with you today. First, I would like to introduce you to a group of Jews who remain relatively obscure in Holocaust history and to provide a working definition of the subject of my research, Jewish prisoner physician, a group that is in fact larger than scholars had anticipated. In discussing them, I am automatically engaging in a discussion of what Primo Levi called the gray zone, a realm of moral ambiguity occupied by the so-called prisoner functionaries on whom Nazis depended to keep the camps running, the inmates who enabled the Nazis to pursue their dual ends of exploiting Jewish labor and murdering Jews. In doing so, I wish to complicate our thinking about people we often label collaborators, and actually to present a concept that I believe helps us better understand both the conduct of Jewish doctors in the camps and the context in which they operated. Due to my research findings, our focus on Jewish prisoner physicians also enables me to complicate the narrative of the Holocaust overall. All too often, the focus is on the Nazis' pursuit of exterminating European Jewry. Yet, as I mentioned, the Nazis had another major goal, the exploitation of the Jewish labor force. And as my research reveals, the exploitation of Jewish labor was not necessarily a means to that end. Uh, the well-known construct of extermination through labor is an oversimplification of historical events. So I will share my screen. So let's establish a working definition of Jewish prisoner physicians. I define them as Jews who, on account of their training as doctors, were recruited by numerous parties to utilize their medical knowledge and skill sets towards a variety of ends in the prisoners' hospitals and outpatient clinics in Nazi camps. Before jumping into the history, however, I want to consider why this group remains relatively obscure. Why haven't historians, or I should say, at least those writing in English, devoted more attention to the Jewish prisoner physicians, especially when considering that source material has been available from the immediate post-war period, with prisoner physicians' memoirs being published as early as 1946, 47, and 48. Pioneering Holocaust scholar Roel Hilbert gets us closer to an answer. 
Near the end of his life, Hilberg reflected, quote, the sheer passage of time governs the slow disintegration of inhibitions that have blocked questions and answers with respect to the behavior of victims in extreme situations. And there's a picture of Hilbert. This is especially true of Jews whose roles in the camps place them in what survivor and author Primo Levi called the gray zone. Levi explains, quote, the hybrid class of the prisoner functionary is a gray zone, poorly defined where the two camps of masters and servants both diverge and converge, end quote. In other words, it is a realm of moral ambiguity because its occupants, including the infamous capos and block elders, were themselves victims of the Nazi regime, being concentration camp inmates to begin with. At the same time, however, prisoner functionaries assigned tasks benefited the Nazi administration of the camp and were often detrimental to their fellow inmates. Given Jewish prisoner physicians' roles in camps, something we will explore shortly, they too were prisoner functionaries who occupied the gray zone. Their dilemmas inherently carried another level of complexity though. Unlike other groups in the camps, they were presumably beholden to a professional code of conduct, the Hippocratic Oath. They were expected to adhere to the principles of beneficence and non-maleficence, to do good and to do no harm. Therefore, any suspected betrayal of this code often struck their fellow inmates as an insult more severe than what they witnessed from other prisoner functionaries. I want to establish that my position is not one of judgment. As Levy writes in his Gray Zone essay, quote, it is necessary to declare the imprudence of issuing hasty moral judgment on such human cases. Certainly the greatest responsibility lies with the system, the very structure of the totalitarian state, end quote. Instead, my goal is understanding to the extent that it is even possible. I want to learn and in turn to share what the Jewish prisoner physicians did, what their circumstances were, how they navigated those circumstances, how did Jewish doctors behave when they found themselves in the extreme and unprecedented context of Nazi camps? And how should we think about this conduct? Many people are tempted to label prisoner functionaries' conduct as collaboration. However, I consider this to be a flawed approach. After all, the term is weighed down with substantial negative connotations. Furthermore, collaboration implies that an inmate made a conscious decision to further Nazi goals. The idea of choice is particularly troublesome in the context of Nazi camps, as the gross power imbalance between Jewish inmates and the Nazi guards and administrators greatly limited, and perhaps even eliminated, the prisoner's ability to pursue a desired course of action especially in the face of likely consequences. I also see terms, uh, sorry, I also see flaws in the use of the term cooperation because the prefix co communicates that two entities of equal or similar stature operate together. I prefer to frame Jewish prisoner physicians conduct differently yet still with the beginning of CO. I look at it as the product of coercion. As this term immediately communicates the existence of this power imbalance that I just mentioned, this power imbalance that is so central to the existence of Jews in these camps. It is behavior that emerges from the use of bodily harm or the threat thereof to compel people to perform acts counter to their desire. Central to my thinking is the doctor's room for maneuver or the extent of an inmate's ability to choose one course of action over another. It is also crucial to think, well, to recognize that this room for maneuver was not static. 
It was constantly shifting in response to ever-changing circumstances in the doctor's midst. It is hardly surprising then that Jewish prisoner physicians' behavior shifted as they reacted to their dynamic environment. As one important course of action, well, and I should say one important course of action could be resistance to the Nazis, something that is really not taken into account when looking through the prism of cooperation and collaboration. So this led me to observe that the best way to address Jewish prisoner physicians' behavior is in a theoretical framework I call the coercion resistance spectrum. And now I would like to share with you how I first came to recognize this dynamic framework, which reflects the spectrum of behavior that prisoner physicians demonstrated. This is the case of Dr. Maximilian Samuel. And here we are looking at a photograph of Samuel in his study in 1932 in Cologne, where he was a prominent practicing obstetrician gynecologist. Samuel stood out to me in, in my research. His name came up quite frequently. Uh, and it stood out because of the harshness of survivor statements against him. On account of his behavior in Block 10, Samuel received the condemnation of many of those who worked in the infamous experimental block in the Auschwitz main camp. This, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, just grab some water. This preliminary impression led Robert J. Lifton to label Samuel as a Jewish medical collaborator, literally, quote, Jewish medical collaborator, devoting a section to Samuel in his very famous book from 1986, The Nazi Doctors. However, if one digs deeper and explores another body of sources, namely the accounts of women upon whom Samuel operated, one emerges with a very different impression of this man. At the crux of the matter, is Samuel's coerced participation in the experiments of two SS doctors, Eduard Wirtz and Horst Schumann, actions that likely took place in this very room. Wirtz was studying the early detection of precancerous lesions of the cervix. Schumann sought to perfect a technique for rapid sterilization of large numbers of people through x-rays, and his protocol called for the eventual removal of the irradiated organs in order to determine the extent of the damage to the tissues. While some fellow staff members in Block 10 deemed Samuel a zealous participant in both experiments, several former experimental victims praised him and considered him to be a savior. The clue that got me thinking was a witness statement by Gilda Eliezer, on whom Samuel had operated in the context of Schumann's experiment. Eliezer reported that Schumann, after performing a cursory examination of her about three months after Samuel performed his surgery, informed her, quote, the operation of Dr. Samuel is not in order. You must have an operation by another doctor, end quote. And that surgery was carried out on November 10th, 1943. After consultation of a variety of sources, documents and testimonies, I concluded that in Eliezer's case and those of it at least four others, Samuel did not adhere to orders and removed the opposite organ and thereby left in place the one that he deemed more likely to heal and thus attempted to preserve the women's fertility. It appears that he was able to take such action because Schumann was not present at the critical moments. In the end, several women whom the Nazis had attempted to render completely sterile were actually able to bear children. The key is that Samuel took advantage of the additional room for maneuver when Schumann was not present and Samuel resisted in the name of minimizing harm. 
The remainder of the time, however, when he was under direct supervision, he was unable to pursue any course of action besides what the Nazi doctors ordered him to do. Relatively few other Jewish prisoner physicians encountered orders to participate in human subject experimentation. A much more common dilemma that they faced was the extent to which they should participate in hospital selections through which SS medical officers and or SS medical orderlies reduced the number of patients in inmate hospitals or clinics by sending typically the sickest and least capable of work to their deaths. The prisoner physicians had to decide what to do. One former prisoner physician points out, quote, in our situation, normal principles of human and professional ethics broke down because the problems we had to face were previously non-existent. And in dealing with them, we did not know what to do, end quote. Their continued presence in the hospital or clinic meant that they were in a position to provide, at least in principle, some medical attention despite the absence of adequate medication and supplies. Yet, such a presence was predicated upon their pleasing their Nazi overseers. To refuse the Nazis outright could lead to removal from their post or perhaps something much more severe. So I'd, I would like to play uh, a video testimony for you. Uh, just to frame it, in many cases, these doctors' course of action was determined by their room for maneuver at any given point, as, as I'm arguing. So we get some insight into this point through the testimony of Dr. Paul Heller, a Czech Jewish doctor who trained in Prague. You're about to see him speaking of his experiences as a prisoner physician in the Auschwitz subcamp of Yevorzno, or Neudachs, from mid-1943 until its evacuation in January of 1945. Whoops, yep, so there is Dr. Paul Heller. And they sent me as a as a, as a physician into a into a work camp near Auschwitz. Sorry about that. I think this is what I meant to do. Yavozno, a mining camp, and that was that was my good luck again. And that was I did that for. One and a half years and As a was, was a was a very very dangerous job. That, that's what it, it, it was. It was fruitful. Job? What? It was a very dangerous job. You said? Yeah, no, I know because you had to take care of um, all the cactic people of all the and the, the SS came and made some selections for the and I. I tried to save a few people, as a matter of fact, some of them are in, in Chicago, of those who were saved, and they, they recognized me, they didn't know that I was here, but recognized me on television just three or four years ago, mm -hmm. and so, well, expressed their enormous gratitude. Well, that was a very, 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 very dangerous job. And, but I was again very lucky that my SS superior was, in, it was already toward the end of the war and these jobs were kept by older people. So the SS man who was in charge of the, of the hospital was a, an older SS man and not a passionate Nazi. So I could engineer him a little, and, and that uh, made it easier, and that saved me. But, you felt but then dangerous. when the one... You felt it was dangerous because it could be... No, well, it could be. I mean, they could have, right. They could have stopped it at any time. Yes. So you felt like you were... And certainly if they accused me of having 
I just <laughs> could hide a lot of people, you know, save them from transports. If they had found out about this, I wouldn't have survived. Well, and then came Thank you for unmuting me. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I heard that the the catchphrase of 2020 and the beginning of 2021 is you're muted. Um, okay. Sorry. I I can't get over how he uses the, the terms to engineer. I mean, it is pretty much speaking directly to this room for maneuver. Um, and the factors that, that made that possible were about uh, timing so much in that, as he points out, it was, it was near, it was as the war was coming to an end, the tide had turned uh, and the people in these positions. So he's talking about likely a medical orderly who was his day-to-day -day supervisor. He was on the older side because all men uh, of fighting age were sent to the, not the dual fronts and who was left behind, someone who wasn't an ardent Nazi. So he had this room for maneuver, also known as wiggle room to accomplish what he wanted to do, which was saving lives. And he knew it was dangerous, as he mentioned, it was a, a very, very dangerous job, as he puts it. But uh, he had a, a way to maneuver. I don't know if you noticed, but uh, near the beginning of the clip, we actually see Dr. Heller move past the deadly nature of the selections in which he participated and instead drew attention to his actions to save lives. And it was all because, uh, well, the lives he could save was because uh, the immediate overseer's political leanings and age afforded him that additional room for maneuver. When he was dealing with someone who was younger and a more ardent Nazi, namely that of the SS medical officer who would come sporadically from the, the main camp of Auschwitz. Heller had less room for maneuver there. He was not able to engineer him. Uh, in fact, he, as we saw, feared severe punishment if his efforts to save inmates became known. So this is just sort of one person illustrating my point, and uh, in in bringing this testimony to you, I I know that you're all educators to a certain extent of about history history of uh, Jews and of the Holocaust. So I I don't know whether you incorporate uh, video testimonies, but I strongly encourage you to do so. I hope you were able to see right here how his words could just go in and illustrate my point. Uh, he says it so much better than I can. So the, you know, this is just a, a nugget to show you what is, what is possible in, uh, in bringing these testimonies into your teaching if you have the ability to do so. Um, so while selections mounted a frequent challenge to Jewish prisoner physicians attempts to save lives, the inadequacy of supplies and horrendous sanitary conditions in the camps constantly undermined medical work. Nevertheless, Jewish prisoner physicians' ingenuity could sometimes overcome these significant hurdles. And I would like to share with you one fascinating example. Dr. Otto, Dr. Otto Heller, presumably uh, no relation to Paul Heller, uh, was the head of the hospital in the so-called Czech family camp of Auschwitz-Birkenau 
which is outlined in red here. He was confronted with a burgeoning epidemic of diphtheria that had already claimed several lives, but he had nothing on hand to treat patients. Heller reasoned that the antibodies present in the blood of those who had survived the infection could help spur the immune system in patients who were in the early stages of the illness. Gottfried Bloch, a medical colleague at the hospital, recalls Heller's actions. Quote, 25 cc's of blood of a convalescent patient were taken in a syringe flashed with citrate to avoid coagulation and given intramuscularly to a new patient as soon as he was diagnosed as having the disease. It worked. We did not lose one more patient from diphtheria, end quote. Heller was just one of dozens, perhaps even a hundred or more, Jewish prisoner physicians recruited for medical work in Auschwitz-Birkenau. While Jewish women like Anna Weiss and Margita Schwalbova had the opportunity to be prisoner physicians from the first days of the women's camp in August 1942, medically trained Jewish men had to wait until March 40, 1943 when chief garrison physician Edward Wirtz officially permitted their recruitment. This policy shift on Jewish prisoner physicians actually offers us insight that speaks to events on a much larger scale. Because the recruitment of Jewish prisoner physicians can serve as an indicator of the importance of Jewish labor, we can trace policy shifts towards Jews overall in response to changing conditions in labor markets and in the German war effort. And it was those conditions in labor markets and the German war effort by the uh, early 1943, by March 43, that spurred Chief Garrison Physician Edward Wirtz to make that statement, allowing Jewish doctors to, for you know, lack of a better word, practice medicine. And so much, so much of what I'm talking about here, uh, when I'm saying hospitals, when I'm saying clinics. It, they need air quotes because uh, what we see in the camps is nothing like a hospital or outpatient clinic that, that we're used to, but I'm utilizing the terms that the, the survivors themselves used. Most indicative of the increasing value of Jewish labor was the establishment of the prisoner's hospital camp in Birkenau section B2F in June, July, 1943. It was here that the highest number of Jewish prisoner physicians were to serve. And the numbers increased as the importance of the Jewish labor force grew. Dated July 8th, 1944, this signature sheet offers insight into just how prevalent Jewish doctors were on the hospital camp staff. Not only were there 11 Jewish doctors working in Birkenau's hospital section, and this is just one page here, uh, but these Jewish doctors were, according to this document, incentivized to continue their work through the distribution of premium China, that's what you see here, or work bonuses in the form of camp scrip. And they were paid bonuses at the same rate as their non-Jewish colleagues. As we saw with Paul Heller's assignment to the Yevorzhno Neue Docks subcamp, Jewish prisoner physicians were transferred to Auschwitz subcamps. So Neue Docks was here in relation to the camps, and I'm about to mention Eintracht here is a document showing a prisoner transfer from Auschwitz to Eintracht Hütte in June 1943, about a month after the munitions factory opened, or the munitions, I should say, the camp next to the munitions factory opened. At least two people on this list of hospital staffers, Karl Sperber and Leo Eitinger, worked as prisoner physicians there. We can also see Paul Heller's name crossed out presumably because he was assigned to Yevorshno instead. We 
with the proliferation of subcamps, sub especially near the end of 1944. Jewish prisoner physicians were transferred to attend, at least in theory, to the medical needs of inmates working in factories or on projects that supported the war effort. On this list of inmate arrivals, we see that Irena Janowitz was transferred from Birkenau to serve as a doctor at the Mauthausen subcamp of Hertenberg, where women were forced to work in the Wilhelm Gustloff Werke munitions factory. So just to reinforce, this changes our perspective of the, the, the typical image of Jews being sent to Birkenau and automatically going towards their death or becoming inmates in the camp for a while and dying. This shows us that Birkenau could also serve as a transfer camp. And it could actually be this launching point for doctors specifically picked to serve, to help support in whatever way they could, despite their mini minimal supplies, uh, this concerted effort to send doctors to subcamps. So just, you know, to, to reinforce this, this is the women's the FKL. Uh, women's concentration camp Auschwitz, which was located in Birkenau. And we see one inmate here, Janowitz, as a, a doctor, a Slovakian Jewish woman, and two other women sent as nurses to Hirtenberg. So far, I've covered Jewish doctors' work in Auschwitz main camp, through Samuel, Auschwitz Birkenau, in mentioning Dr. Uh, Otto Heller and uh, the doctors in the hospital, Auschwitz subcamps, that would be uh, Dr. Paul Heller, and uh, the subcamp attached to the Mauthausen concentration camp. But I, I just want to identify these doctors' presence, these Jewish prisoner physicians' presence was spread even wider. Um, so beyond subcamps of many, uh, pretty much all of the other major concentration camps, Jewish doctors could be found as medical recruits in forced labor camps for Jews in Germany, in annexed Poland, in occupied Poland, aka the general government or the general gouvernement, collection camps, transit camps. Many have heard of Drancy in, in France and Westerbork in the Netherlands, through which Anne Frank passed. And even in extermination camps, there were Jewish doctors serving as doctors in Treblinka. And you might wonder, what, what are the, the roles of, of doctors in especially these extermination camps? They as in other places, were recruited to support the labor force. In this case, the Jewish labor force that was assigned to uh, cleaning out the, uh, the gas chambers, um, collecting and sorting the clothing and jewelry, et cetera, of the Jews. These were Jewish laborers, nevertheless, and they were <clears throat> they became quite expert at their tasks, and it behooved the Nazis to have doctors around to keep them going and also to prevent the outbreak of epidemic diseases because then those epidemics could sort of jump from the Jewish prisoners to the Nazis, something they really did not want to happen. What were they doing in transit camps where labor wasn't so much of an issue? Uh, they were actually making sure that Jews were healthy enough. It's the strange Nazi reasoning, but attempting to make sure Jews were healthy enough 
to actually be transported to extermination camps. Um, they tried to do the best that they, they could. They tried to keep people off of transport lists. Um, and the same goes with uh, these collection camps. A lot of them really tried their best to keep people off of transport lists, but nevertheless, in, in many of those cases, they didn't have that room for maneuver because quotas had to be met. So in the, in the time remaining, I sort of wanna zoom in on, on one category that I have listed here, that being forced labor camps for Jews and it's in annex Poland. Um, and really this, this category has, has received next to no attention in English language scholarship. And it's these forced labor camps for Jews in the Wartego, a territory in Western Poland that was annexed to Germany in 1939. And I wanna show you one of the most interesting things I found during my archival research. So here are two train ticket stubs. One indicates that on August 12th, 1943, the bearer traveled from Berlin to Posen, the capital of the Wartego, now known as Posen, uh, and in Poland. The other one is from the bearer's trip back to Berlin on August 26th, 1943. Who was this traveler? His name was Dr. Konrad Albert Frankel, a Jewish doctor, according to Nazi race laws, who was among at least 11 Jewish doctors, some full Jews, some converts to Christianity, some in so-called mixed marriages, dispatched from Berlin to Posen on official emergency service assignments to utilize their medical expertise in the preservation of Jewish labor capacity in forced labor camps for Jews in the Wartego. To provide context, the Helmno death camp, also located in the Wartego, had been in operation since December of 1941. Nevertheless, after receiving emergency service notices, these doctors boarded trains without chaperones, without escorts, and traveled to the specified destination where they were expected to help keep Jewish workers working. Because Jews in the Vartiga were not under the jurisdiction <clears throat> excuse me, jurisdiction of the SS until 1943. Civilian authorities, as well as public and private business ventures, had control over the camps and could profit directly from Jewish labor. These include municipalities like the city of Posen, which ran 20 camps. Public contractors included the Reich Autobahn, which established a series of forced labor camps to extend the Berlin to Frankfurt an der Oder route eastwards to Posen, starting in late 1940. Other camps contained Jewish forced laborers working on projects for one or a collection of private construction and civil engineering firms. The Wartegau had at least 250 forced labor camps for Jews overall. Likewise, labor offices on the, the Reichsgau, that would be the Wartegau level, on the district level, on, county, on the county level, uh, all these labor offices were highly invested in the Jewish doctor's assignment to the camps within their respective territories because these officials were responsible for fulfilling the profiteers' requests for capable work in the midst of a labor supply crisis triggered and then exacerbated by the German war efforts demand for fighters. The entities running the camps and profiting from Jewish labor activity pursued the assignment of Jewish doctors for medical service and set the recruitment process in motion. After all, only relatively healthy forced laborers, or to phrase it in another way, only the laborers who were not thoroughly incapacitated could work. And the Jewish medical recruits 
had the knowledge and skill sets, at least in theory, to maintain the labor capacity of the Jewish workforce so jobs could be completed. Uh, so what, what you've seen here is um, looking at archival material that survives from the time itself. So that's one, one body that I, I use in, in my research. I've also turned to, as you can see, uh, the video testimonies of, of survivors and their statements. So there, I, I came across uh, sort of a, a short memoir of this woman uh, named Edith Kramer at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. And she tells this really fascinating story. So I, I as you can gather, I, I work on these different levels. I work on the macro level, looking at these large scale issues such as how uh, the labor market was, the war effort, and how that influenced the recruitment of these Jewish doctors. But then I jump in and work on the personal level too. So Cromer gives me that, uh, the, the Cromer memoir, and it, it turns out that um, she also gave audio testimony that can be found through uh, the Holocaust Museum. Uh, she gives me this amazing story. Um, so it, it really begins in the spring of 1942. And again, to set the context, uh, Helmno was in operation exterminating Jews from December of 41. So here we have Cromer receiving uh, a notice for emergency service, an, an emergency service order, telling her that she is to report to Posen. She's a doctor in Berlin with uh, as much of a private practice as one could have at that time with, with Jews licensed to practice medicine revoked. She was what was known as a Krankenbehandler, uh, literally uh, a treater of the sick. And she was told, okay, come back to, you can come back to Berlin. You'll be back in, in a few weeks. We just need you for, for duty in, uh, in the Wartegau, in the area around Posen. And she was told, since it was a few weeks, she just packed some spring garments, little did she know she wouldn't make it back to, to Berlin for quite some time. Uh, and she was allowed to travel on her own. The only thing she was responsible for was showing up in Posen on uh, the, you know, with, within a time frame. So she traveled without escort, on a train and it's this is a completely different jew on a train story from what we hear in the holocaust she traveled alone uh to a destination because she was a doctor and there she was sent to work as a doctor in several forced labor camps for jews in the region uh and based on my research it appears that she was the only female doctor recruited for this task. Um, there were several other men who were recruited for this task. And probably one of the f my favorite images conjured up by, um, by the, the material I've come across. She, she writes of having sort of literal room for maneuver in that because she was needed to work at several camps, she was given a bicycle uh, to ride between camps so she could do her job as a doctor. As, again, as much as she could with very limited supplies and really horrendous sanitary facilities. Um, and she writes and speaks of biking along certain roads. She, she was restricted in terms of the route she could take, but nevertheless, she was able to travel on her own between these camps. And here was a Jew wearing a, a Jewish, a yellow Jewish star on a bicycle emblazoned with a swastika. 
So just some really amazing, amazing stories. Uh, so just that, that mental image really blows my mind. Uh, so th that, that's just something I wanted to share with you. Um, so I've given you these, these nuggets, but I'd like to spend the remainder of our time fielding your questions and ideally also engaging in some discussion about Jewish prisoner physicians and their morally challenging circumstances. And here's an issue with which to start out. Uh, of course, we can take this in any direction you want. I could answer the questions. I see something popped up in the chat. Um, but what I, what I want to sort of put out there is were Jewish prisoner physicians held to a higher standard of conduct? In his testimony for the USC Shoah Foundation Visual History Archive, Kurt Baum recalls a former Jewish prisoner physician by the name of George Ivanter saying, quote, if you talk about war criminals, George Ivanter certainly would have been one. Not only did he not help people, but he was an extortionist. He asked for gold or for other me methods of payment for his patients to get treatment, end quote. If Ivanter had been a shoemaker demanding compensation for the repair of a shoe, would Baum be accused of being a war criminal? So just, you know, what is it about doctors? Should we hold them to higher standards? Or should we just say, here is someone in a horrible situation doing what they could do to survive? So just something to throw out there, because after all, the theme of the conference is about uh, health workers. So. Um, I'll address the, okay, we got stuff coming up in the, the, the chat. Yeah. Um, I apologize, Dr. Yeah. Spiegel. Uh, we are used to doing it by chat and I asked them to do yes. it by chat. And Paul reminded me that you'd prefer right. that people unmute themselves. So for those of you who, um, first of all, may I ask um, Dr. Siegel if we could stop sharing the screen? That way people- Oh gosh, sorry, together. thank you so much for reminding yeah. me. Yes, okay. yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. And then um, for those of you who are not used to using the raise hand function, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you might see a little button that says reactions. There's a little smiley face. And within that, there's a hand that looks like this. And if you click on that, a little hand will show up in the corner of your screen the way it is in Paul's or was for a moment there. That's the way we'll know to call on you. So give it a try. I, uh, though, um, Dr. Siegel, since we do have um, some who had a question, for instance, I know that uh, Emily Pariente had a question. Emily, may I call on you to unmute yourself? Uh, well, one of my questions was, did any of these doctors attempt to escape? That was one when they were in transit, um, which they maybe would have been hard to do, but would have been understandable. And the other was, were any efforts made by them that you have, they have documented that helped the older children who might've gone to the hospitals or in other ways? Um, uh, I, I got the first, the first question, but okay. I'm not quite sure what you mean by the second one, help the older children. Well, children, most of the yeah. young children were exterminated, I'm assuming, but um, if there were older children in the camps and they had an opportunity to help them in some way, is there any um, documentation on that, whether it was through the hospital or, or anything else? Um, okay, so to address the, the first one, mm -hmm. um, odds are if they tried to escape, I'd lose their, their trail because what I'm going in for my, <laughs> for my material, I'm going in for, uh, I guess, proof that they existed in the Nazi documents, somehow showing that, that they served as a doctor in a particular place at a particular time uh, and, um, and looking for their own statements saying that I served as a doctor. So, uh, so that would, I, because of my, I guess you could say, uh, bias, I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. looking for those other people. So I, I can't give you an answer. Right. right. Um, 
they they were expected to be at a certain place with within a, a window of time. Mm-hmm. They knew that um, that the the Nazis would not be pleased, to say the <laughs> least, if um, if they didn't show up uh, when and where they were instructed. And you know, the Nazis had information about their families. Who who knows what would have gone sure, through their sure. heads? I think, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so I I have sort of the trace of doctors who did follow those instructions. Um, the children, for the most part, uh, where you have that, uh, that splitting of the younger people being killed, that usually happened upon arrival. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's not a point at which the Jewish doctors could exercise their room for maneuver. That was really to, within hospitals or at, you know, definitely within the camp with, uh, with inmates who had already been registered. Um, uh, but once they, they saw that someone was a patient, they did the best that they, they could. Um, when it came to deciding who would receive the really, really minimal supplies that they had. They would be conversations. Um, and, and doctors to this day still do this. And I, I believe that Dr. Rudensky was largely influenced to pick this theme because of COVID, because of the pandemic, because of how important healthcare has become to all of us, just how prominently it exists in our lives now. And uh, so there are doctors still engaging in these conversations. And I think we all remember those horrible days when there weren't enough ventilators. Um, And doctors had to decide, you know, these ethics commissions had to decide who would get a ventilator. Well, not surprisingly, the doctors in the camps had limited supplies too. We were not talking ventilators here, Um, but we're we're talking the most basic of painkillers, and sometimes these really uh, early antibiotics. Really small supplies, to whom do they give it? And in those conferences, it, it appears that across the board, the decision was to give it to the young uh, because they, they viewed it as the young people, their bodies were stronger and they had a greater chance of survival. So, I can't say that, you know, they're, they're young people that you're talking, that you might be referring to, um, but the relatively young of the, the people who were in those health facilities. So that's how I'd answer your question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, Mr. Wilner. Uh, yes. Um, uh, thank you for your talk. My question is about the results of medical experiments. I don't know, of course, and either do you, to what extent Jewish doctors were involved in experiments, but I want to raise an ethical question I've always thought about. The results of, of these experiments, to what extent do you know if those results, while medically and ethically not proper, for example, doing surgery without anesthesia and other kinds of things that a doctor would not ordinarily do under the Hippocratic Oath, but these were done. The results of these, I assume, were put in writing by Nazi doctors who are very uh, manuscript concerned. Today, in the medical world, to what extent, if any, are these results adhered to? Have they been thrown out the window? Can you tell me what you know about the results of these horrible experiments? Um, That is an amazing question, and that would probably require an entire lecture, if not a conference to address so many of those issues. But um, just to touch upon a a few things there, uh, in a way, the the issue is a bit of a red herring when when we're asking about should should these results be used, because that does come up a lot. Uh, The majority of those experiments were not of an especially rigorous 
scientific nature. They wouldn't hold up it to uh, an internal review board, um, to peer review, things like that. Um, however, <clears throat> although we would really love for you know, psychological reasons to, to just say what the Nazis did was not science, was not medicine, that they were really unhinged people. We, we'd love to say that because confronting the reality that they were actually top medical scientists, some of whom were recruited by the US after the war to work on, um, uh, to work in the space race, um, people who were directly involved in these horrific experiments, uh, they were great scientists in some cases. Um, they did use top-notch, state-of-the-art medical approaches to their research. What they didn't do was pay any attention to the humanity of their victims. So, uh, so it's, you know, that really difficult reality in some cases, but for the most part, it, it was not uh, scientifically rigorous. Um, and the results that they yielded were more on the, along the lines of sort of gross, as in, you know, macro large scale, not gross as in disgusting, uh, observations. And it's not necessarily what scientists use, it's what we use in our, well, not so daily lives anymore, but if you, you know, back, if you remember when you would get on a plane and you would be told that the life vest found under your seat uh, or in the compartment beside you, uh, that you were to inflate that, I mean, actually not <laughs> inflate it uh, until you were about to get off the plane, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the design of that was actually influenced by Nazi medical experiments. Um, so there's that. In terms of if we're talking about specific data, the, uh, the one that has been used by doctors, by scientists, et cetera, um, would be the freezing experiments. Because one of the if you could say this, benefits of uh, what the Nazis had, this carte blanche opportunity to work with human beings who weren't viewed as human beings, they could uh, partake in what, what's called a terminal experiment. Terminal as in it leads to, to the experimental victim's death, which is something you, no one can really do. So they could take it to the furthest extent that that's possible. So uh, they were able to find out uh, through following through tracking uh, heart rate, uh, core body temperature, etc. Um, what happened to humans when put in in frozen water. So uh, I, I just realized um, Dr. Rudensky popped up and, and I believe that I'm going to get the hook. So well, I, I think we are just about out of time. Um, uh, but let me, uh, on behalf of myself and, and everybody here, thank you, um, Dr. Siegel, for a really a, a great presentation. And you raised a lot of questions. I really liked what you said about the gray zone. And, and as we think about the Jewish doctors in the whole Nazi system and all of the different you know, sort of the, the different aspects that you shared with us, including these people from Berlin who were going to labor camps on bicycles i mean but uh and and including what you just talked about now with the with the, the experimentation um thank you so much it was really really very valuable and very interesting um i we may have more questions uh i would like to say if anybody if it's okay with you dr siegel if anybody has questions they could send them to me and i could forward them on to you if that's Great. okay and um, no, thank you so much. Um, I do want to make one other announcement, but I know that Liz would like to ask people to unmute. unmute. So after Liz makes her, her request, I would just want to make an announcement to everybody else on the Zoom chat. I mean, on the Zoom call. So go, Liz, go ahead. 
Hi, everybody. I know you will uh, want to join me in unmuting and thanking Dr. Siegel. So please, let's do that now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well researched. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.